80% of dudes rapping, they ain't nice as me 98% ain't live the same type of life as me The judge gave me life and then they sent me where the life is be That level forward depth and vice, the type of stuff they like to see Two choices, fight or flee, I refuse to die a chump I've never been a mark, but damn it's scary when that riot jump I've seen dudes cry, get pumped, or some sexually brutalized I knew a dude who lost his life and he was only doing five Year long racial fights when homie all you do is ride Lonely days and nights have been a whole cause in suicide From the moment you arrive, you see the Mexican Mafia AB skinheads with big giant swastikas Pro-black philosophers, the BGF, the Kumi And Muslims who will murk you from the nation to the Sunni That MS was loony, quick to ride up on they rival Even Christians went to church, hide knives up in a Bible Political and tribal, the Crips and Damus The Long Beast, the Hubs and the Dubs and the Grooves The IE, the Bakersfield the day go pop rules the hustlers quick to roll the gangsters don't move whatever click you choose and, and how long did you stay at Cal calipatra before you was transferred to the next uh level four uh so i got there in march of 95 i turned 17 in july of 95 um around august or or, or september they moved me to d yard and i stayed on d yard until right before my birthday um, so I bought a year and seven months, somewhere around a year and six months, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And then I got transferred out to another institution. And so what was that? What was that next institution that they sent you to? Uh, the, the next institution was Lancaster State Prison in Lancaster, California. Now, I've heard a lot about Lancaster. That's another prison that I've never been and been to. And, you know, um, Lancaster is located not too far um, from from Los Angeles. And so I've heard yeah. of it was predominantly a lot of black COs down there. And, of course, you had a lot of Los Angeles Bloods and Crips trying to get there due to the close proximity to Los Angeles in order to get visits and stuff like that. So what was your experience at Lancaster like? Lancaster was different, man. It was uh, – that was my kind of my interest. Lancaster, to be honest, was like a hustle prison, man. That was that was the first prison where I seen them get into it. You know, they was getting a bag, you know what I mean? And – um, uh kind of rewinding the story about going, you know, fucking with niggas under paperwork. Uh, I had got into another cell fight with a nigga that was there. And uh, I ended up moving. It was well-known Blue Note from Raymond. It's called Love Me Death. And uh, he was the first one to kind of give me my game, telling me about the prison part. He was the first one that I actually listened to. You know what I'm saying? To kind of like listen to and believe everything that he said. You know what I'm saying? He never, until this day, he never told me anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And Skull, yes, most definitely a real well-known uh, individual in prison. Um, and so you said a lot of hustle was going on at Lancaster, people getting paper and stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, because it was closer to the L.A. proximity. So any dudes, you know, what, what the CDC does is is if you're from Sacramento, what they do is they try to disrupt your family. They send you way down south. So they know that you're not going to be getting a lot of visits, you know what I'm saying? So if you're from Los Angeles, they send you way up here. But Lancaster... You know, there was a lot of dudes from L.A., a lot of black correctional officers. That was my first time seeing it like that. And um, so it was a lot of money going on, a lot of money plays going on on the yard. So that was my first introduction to being able to um, to, to make some money. You know what I mean? Because um, I didn't have shit. Yeah, I still didn't have no family support, none of that shit. You know, I'll be honest. Uh, my mom was in and out of prison. You know what I'm saying? So when I caught my case, my mom went to prison shortly after. Okay. So any type of support system, and my brother did too. He went to the California Youth Authority right after so my little sister who was at the time like 10 years old she was being raised by family members being moved around so i had no support so the only support that i had was by myself you know what i'm saying and what what i accumulated while i was in prison right so um where when you was at calipat did did anybody bless you with a tv or if not how long did it take you to you know to come up on a tv i'll be honest with you bro i didn't get my first tv until i was in prison maybe about Seven years. It took mm -hmm. me about seven years to get my own personal TV. Wow. Uh, and I, and to be honest, I, you know, how I, I started hustling stamps and, and porn books. You know what I'm saying? So I would get a book of stamps, trade my sack lunches or, or doing, you know, gambling, whatever it was. And at the time they used to have like a website or, or like a, you can, you can write a PO box and send them like $50 in stamps. And they in return would send you 10, pornographic magazines uh -huh. so then i would take that 50 dollars in stamps and, and buy 10 magazines and take the magazines and come back in there and then sell them for like 10 15 dollars worth of stamps right so i turned that 50 dollars into 150 dollars you know what i'm saying so that's how i was hustling 
And then I was able to got blessed to find a motherfucker, you know what I'm saying, to uh trade those those stamps into uh, uh cash. Like right. people who wanted to buy books and stamps, they would have their 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 uh family mail me money for like maybe a sixty percent profit. So I would give them like a hundred dollars worth of stamps for sixty five dollars. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It's that type of situation. Especially dudes that was doing like a lot of legal work. Going to the law library had a lot of uh, stuff they wanted to mail out. Those were my number one clients at the time. And so, did you happen to see any type of violence at, at Lancaster? Uh, a lot of squabbles. You know what I'm saying? A lot of fights. They had a couple, maybe one or two stabbings, but it was just you know what I'm saying like random type shit. You know what I mean? Uh, nothing. Most of the blacks were programming, man. You know, a lot of. I'll be honest with you. It's some weirdest shit. I saw a black Southsider in a cell with a crip. You know what I'm saying? Like. And I knew him. I knew him. And Lancaster State Prison, man, there was a black Southsider in a cell with a crib. That's how much motherfuckers was getting their money, man. You know what I'm saying? Motherfuckers was really on some money shit. The Hispanics, that was the first time I ever really been to a prison where they was doing deals openly with blacks. You know what I'm saying? They, you know, they pedigree is, you know, they don't take food from us. They don't do no transaction with us. Lancaster was open. Like I said, it was, it was, it was borderline like being free. You know what I'm saying? It's cell phones were popping back then, but it was so much money being streamed to their yard that the violence was at zero. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it was very seldomly uh, a lot of bullshit going. And I'm only speaking for my yard. The other yards I can't attest for because I only hit my yard. So right. I mean, and, and so obviously the Southsiders didn't have any problems with the black Southsider being in the cell with the crib. He he he. I, I don't know his. I, I could be in depth with you. I, you know what I'm saying? Like. He he was from Santa Maria, and his daughter was a girl that I knew. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was well respected by them, man. You know what I mean? And I I don't know, I, I don't know why, bro. A lot of people are gonna listen like a motherfucker, but it was facts, one hundred percent. And so, how long did you stay at Lancaster before you uh was moved to your next prison? I actually went out to court from Lancaster, so. Going back to when the judge told me, I don't feel for your safety. You are, you know, big enough and old enough to survive in the prison settings. I had uh, my case was overturned in 1997. So uh, I'm in the vocation back there. Uh, and they call me and tell me, hey, pack your stuff up. You're being transferred for out to court. Your curse was I didn't even know. They never sent me nothing in the mail saying, hey, you're going to be going to court on such and such a day. I just got the call. And I'm gonna keep it 100. Like I said the yard was so plush, so cool. I, I didn't even want to leave. I, you know what I mean? It was different for me. And so, at the age of you know 16, when you first come to prison, 16, 17, who was helping you with your, you know, with, with your appeal, fighting, fighting the legal situation that you had found yourself in? Because for those who don't know, they automatically um, supply you with a uh, an appellate attorney. So if that is that what you was dealing with and stuff? Or yeah, I, I had a cool appellate attorney. He was cool as fuck, man. He was always in contact with him. Every every letter that I hit him, he was court appointed. You know, all the lust. I would go and do my own legal work. To be honest, I was helping him without with a lot of motions and stuff, uh, present all kind of evidence and stuff against my for my case, and I would send it to him. He would reply back. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, you know, at the, at the time of of my um, um, overturning. It, they had returned. They had overturned my case so fast and got it to CDC that the letter hadn't even got to me yet. That that was the problem. It hadn't even gotten to me yet. So I just like I said, I just got the call. And and due to your case being overturned, what exact changes were made in the case? Was your time reduced or what? what no, uh, what they wanted to do pretty much was fix their problem. So they had sentenced me to California State Prison at the age of sixteen without going through the California Youth Authority first. Uh -huh. So when when the individual was tried as an adult. He's supposed to still go to California Youth Authority to be diagnosed to see if he's mentally capable to survive in the prison settings. So by them not giving me that shot, they had overturned the case. And now they were en route to try to fix the mistake that they had done the first time. Oh, OK. And yeah. So, so they sent they sent me to YA for a 90 day observation after I had already been to two prisons and had already been in prison for three years. So after that 90 day observation, I'm assuming they they uh, they deemed you mature enough to go right back to the male prison. Yeah, pretty much. They I went right back in front of the same judge. You know what I'm saying? He was like, hey, you know, what I mean, sorry. You know, what I mean, but yeah, you, you, you know, they pretty much resentenced me back to the 33 or 10 month sentence. 
And um, at this point in time, they sent me back to Wasco. And um, when I leave Wasco this time, I don't return to Lancaster. They sent me to they sent me to Salinas Valley State Prison. And around what year was that? That was uh, January of 1998. Okay. And so uh, Salinas is another prison notorious for a lot of violence. Um, so um, what yard did they send you to? And in, 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 uh, what was going on when you hit the yard? Uh, they sent me to a yard, a yard. I'm um, saying at the Salinas Valley. Uh, at that time, uh, it was different. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, mm-hmm. when, when I was in Calipat, Lancaster, like I said, outside of the, the time that those four Northerners that hit the yard, you didn't you didn't see Northerners. You know what I'm saying? You didn't see Bulldogs. You didn't see none of that shit. So uh, when I got to Salinas Valley, that was the first time when I pulled up and I saw. Bulldogs on the yard, you know what I'm saying? It was Bulldogs from Fresno. They was on the yard. They was they wasn't deep, but they was they had a nice collection. It was it was a nice amount of them. Uh-huh. So uh uh another weird thing it was weird for me is you know when I was in Wasco the first time, Wasco houses dudes from LA, Bakersfield, Fresno. And for the Hispanics, like I said, the Fresno Bulldogs had a nice uh, that's their reception. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a Southern reception as well, but you're going to run into a lot of Bulldogs. You know what I'm saying? And that was the first time because when I was in Wasco, the Bulldogs in 95 was associating with us. They was on our side of the day room. You know what I'm saying? They used to get their hair braided just like us. You know what I'm saying? They had swag like us. So when I get to Salinas Valley, this is my first time seeing any Bulldogs again. They on the side of the day room with the Southerners. You know what I'm saying? This is when they 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 had already had their part their separation from the northerners, uh-huh. so they they was programming with uh, the southerners at this time. So can you can you explain the dynamics and the relationship at that time between the blacks and the northerners? At that time, uh, the northerners was pretty cool. You know what I mean? They they had um, they had a good relationship with us. You know what I'm saying? Um, at this point in time, they were between the CDC because. Even though the Bulldogs was associating themselves with the Southsiders, they still was at war with the Northerners. So the Northerners and Bulldogs, I've never been on the yard where they associate. They was always, anytime a Northerner would come, the Bulldogs would be the first one to trounce them. You know I mean? They, they, the, the Bulldogs, I ain't going to lie to you, man, they was different. You know what I'm saying? Them, them, you know, no disrespect to any of the Mexicans. I grew up with a lot of them. Them, them, was, them dudes was different. You know what I'm saying? They all had squabble. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they had a different or about themselves, you know what I'm saying? That's why they kind of stand out because the, them dudes was different, man. Uh, and so the Northerners at that time with the Bulldogs was on the yard. They didn't really, they didn't really socialize because they wasn't there. You know what I mean? Up until when the Southsiders uh, kicked it back up with the Bulldogs, and you know what I mean? Uh, no Northern was even on that yard. It, when I first got there, it was just Bulldogs, Southerners, and it was just the Blacks and the others on the other side on the other side of the day room or yard per se. Uh-huh. I mean, and you, you had related an incident to me um, about a time when you was chilling, playing cards with a northerner and um, an incident took place. Yeah. This was kind of like the separation between the blacks and the northerners. You know what I'm saying? When the northerners was on the yard and there was no longer bulldogs, uh, me and my boy Yogi from main street, we used to go on the yard and play a uh, pinochle against two northerners. And so it would be me from here and then him on that end and it'd be two Northerners on these ends. And uh, I never forget, we playing like probably $100 a game, $5 a set, some shit like that. And another Northerner had walked up while we were playing cards and slit the face of the dude sitting next to me. You know what I'm saying? And it, that shit just like, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? He just walked up and just walking, walk. And the blood gushing out every way, you know. We splattered. What the fuck, you know what I'm saying? He just kind of dart off, and um, it didn't set off any wars between the blacks and the northerns. But what it did, it, it they had nowhere to go from that point because the blacks kind of pretty much went and told them, like, "Hey, man, y'all fucked up, bro. Y'all ain't supposed to do no shit like that without letting us know." So you know what I mean? We kind of told them like they on their own. So they didn't even have no day room to go to. So you know what I mean? They we we told them off the dribble like y'all can't be on our side of the day room in our building. You know what I'm saying? Like y'all, y'all, y'all going to the yard. So uh, they felt some type of way about it. You know what I mean? But it was no, there was no war that ensued over it. They just kind of respected because they, they was in a no win situation. And so I guess the brothers on the yard was upset about that they didn't get a courtesy call. 
Yeah, we. It, I mean, that's just kind of how it is. Like, if the Seven's about to do something to their own, you know what I'm saying? They, they, they little shot caller, whoever they see, and kind of tell the blacks, like, hey, bro, like, you know, it's going to be ugly. You know what I'm saying? Get your people out the way. You know what I mean? They might give you a courtesy and let you get to the store if it's going to be something huge because we're going to be on some sort of big lockdown. Uh, but definitely, definitely not uh, attacking another uh, one of your own in the mix or nature, you know what I'm saying, of, of another race, another gang. That shit just don't occur respectfully. You know what I'm saying? Like, that shit could have got ugly for him. Right. You know I mean, so. And so you say when you when you got the Salinas, um, that's when you started running across a lot of the more reputable. Yeah, TS and them. TS was over on BR. Uh, they, you know what I mean? A uh, horse, all them dudes. Uh, Big U had hit the yard. Um, Hoover Line had hit the yard. Uh, my boy D, you know what I'm saying? D was from West Side Piru. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of it was a lot of reputable dudes that hit that yard, man. C from our six oh six oh C off from six oh, Boosie from six oh. It was a lot of dudes that I had already know, known of or heard of, you know what I'm saying, was on that yard that kind of came through there, you know what I'm saying, at one point in time. Right. So you you had also, is this where you had mentioned to me earlier? You had uh you had been in the building, I believe you said when when uh someone had committed suicide. Yeah, man, it was a weird shit, man. So um, I was in A section about like 210 to 211. So I can kind of oversee the B section, C section side. And a bus had kind of came in, you know what I mean? And um, you would see like, you see the white boy kind of go up in the cell. I don't know what happened, but he kind of went to a cell by himself. And, and then, you know, the wood, we, you know, the wood pile, which, you know what I mean? The institutionalized uh, nickname we give him was kind of at his door. You know, you already know what they're asking. Like, bro, slide that paperwork. You know what I'm saying? We want to know what you in jail for, what crimes you in jail for, such and such. You know what I mean? And uh, and they had kind of let us out for, I believe it was child. It might have been yard. And, I, and I'm looking across and I see the white boy kind of go to the um, to the stairwell. And he wrapping the sheet around. He just wrapping and he tying the sheet. And he tying the sheet along the rail. You know, motherfucker going be jumping off the bridge and shit, jumping into the right. water, bungee jumping. You know what I'm saying? He just kind of caught, went, caught speed and just ran and just jumped over the fucking tier, bro. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And pretty much tried to hang himself. You know mm. what I mean? He was dangling. You know what I'm saying? He was dangling like a motherfucker. And, uh, obviously, they put the yard down. You know what I mean? I don't think he died, but definitely was an attempt to, to, to kill himself. He tried to hang himself from, mm. from the top tier. And so, of course, I guess when the COs see it, they they hit the alarm and they hit the alarm, kind of put everybody down so they can kind of uh, uh, isolate the situation. You know what I'm right. saying? Um, yeah. So it, it was a he still was in his jumpsuit. You know what I'm saying? Like he was still in his jumpsuit. So I, you know, I'm just assuming he might have been a child molester or some sort of like that. That I don't know why he did. It, you know what I'm saying? But that that was that was a weird situation that I had saw. And you know, so. They they was able to get in there in, in time enough to, to get him down and stuff. And uh, he was out. I don't know if it broke his neck because, like, you know, he 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 ran. Like I said, like, he was jumping over. Like I see these dudes bungee jumping over a damn cliff into a water. That's mm -hmm. what the fuck he did, bro. He just ran and just, you know what I'm saying, jumped. And then when he, he – it he, he didn't loosen up or nothing. He just was swinging. And he was dangling from his neck. You know what I'm saying? He was dangling from his neck. He was out cold. I don't know if the 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 – did, did, his, did he break his neck upon, you know what I'm saying, slide down? But he was out for the count, you know what I'm saying? But did he die or was he dead? I, I, I wasn't for sure. I don't believe he died. But um, it was a, a, for sure a great attempt to kill himself, for sure. Right. To dive over a tear like that was definitely an attempt to kill himself. And then you had also mentioned me an uh, incident about uh, somebody by the name of Rico who had who had caused a riot or something. So that that, I, that had happened when I was in uh, Corcoran State Prison, another oh, level four great. institution, and this dude <clears throat> was different. He was a, a black He was he was a he was a black he was black and Mexican, but he was a blood. Like I'm saying, this dude spoke fluent Spanish, uh, had nice curly way, but he was dark as me. You know what I'm saying? But he was raised by his mother and his Hispanic family. But I don't know how he chose to. Um, become a blood. I don't know. You don't even remember what city he was from, uh -huh. but um, he uh, was a disrespectful, just a loud mouth dude. He was neighbors to some white dudes that worked in the kitchen. You know, kitchen workers usually have to get up at like two, three in the morning. And, uh, you know, they kind of knock on the door like, hey, bro, turn the music down. He over there still full blasting his music. And uh, when, when when they came out for chat, because I worked in the kitchen when, when it first, when it kicked off. 
uh, white boy came out and tore his ass up and started yeah. stabbing him up. You know what I'm saying? And once blacks get wind of what's going on, uh, that riot got ugly for the white boys. You know what I mean? Like, they got to throwing white boys over the tier, all kind of shit. You know what I mean? Because most of the staff was in the kitchen. They was already outside on the yard or in the kitchen. You know what I mean? Kind of monitoring people at child hall. So by the time they got over there, it was it was ugly. You know what I'm saying? The blacks had already pretty much uh, uh, kind of did did the number on them. So immediately, I guess when uh, somebody black happens to notice the white dude stabbing Rico, the riot just kicked off from it there. It just kicked off. It was in our building. We was in two buildings. Yeah, so pretty much that's how it was. You know what I mean? When they had let our building out, uh, the white boy came out and just started doing his shit. You know what I'm saying? No, he didn't ask for. I mean, uh, I've seen a multiple incidents like that where it's just where the disrespect is too much that like they ain't giving no heads up. You know what I'm saying? Like, motherfuckers didn't disrespect the people's, you know what I mean? Like, and they kind of usually, like, at most level four institutions, the white boy kind of come to their rep and be like, hey, man, your boy over disrespectful. You know what I'm saying? Take care of him. Same with the Hispanics, the vice versa. Uh, but this dude, at some point in time, like a lot of dudes didn't really fuck with him. You know what I'm saying? Because even though he was black and he claimed he was a blood, he had a cholo side to him. So motherfuckers kind of like, man, what's up with this dude? You know what I'm saying? Like uh -huh. his whole interaction was a diff little bit different. During my whole 18 year sentence, uh, I had ran into about four to five white crips. I ran into one white blood. I didn't run into a few black Southsiders. Um, uh, I didn't run into some Samoans. I didn't run into a black, you know, I didn't run into some of the dudes that was half black, half Samoan, and they chose to ride others. You know what I mean? They was black as all outdoors, but Charles chose to ride others. Uh, but that situation was the only time in my whole career where I saw the whites uh, take off on another white crit. And the only reason why I think they got away with this is because I had walked back with him from Chow. He was from Long Beach, but he was from a, he wasn't from Insane. He wasn't from 20s. He wasn't from Young Founder, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't, I don't even know what gang he was from. I don't even remember, to be honest. But he was a white boy that he just, he had nigga swag, you know what I'm saying? But he didn't have nigga swag, you know what I'm saying? Like, motherfuckers really didn't know how to read him. So nobody was really kind of trying to embrace the dude, you know what I'm saying? And I remember we walking to the chow hall and kind of coming up, and, and I walked to my cell. This is the same cell I was in at 210. And he, once I go in my cell, close the door, that's when the white being the opportunity. And uh, he went down about like 205, and they ran up the stairs on both ends and trapped him in and just and tore him up bad. They stabbed him up pretty bad. And, um, <clears throat> you know, for the lack of better, let me be honest with you, there was no retaliation for it. Like I said nobody really, really fucked with that dude. You know right. what I'm saying? Nobody, even the Long Beach car didn't embrace him. You know what I'm saying? So, because he was from like, I don't know, a tagger gang that turned crip or some shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was something to that sort where they didn't even respect his hood. It was a ride for him. You feel me? But that was the only time. You know what I'm saying? It was, I had a homeboy pull up. I had fact, <clears throat> throughout my time, I had two homeboys pull up on the yard with me and never had an issue. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it was, we was on alert, but it was never an issue. Like, nobody never kind of like, you know what I mean? Try to do their shit. Uh huh. And so, um, now you on these level fours, you know, you dealing with the day to day madness and stuff. What is, what is your, what is your, uh, your mindset like? Are you concerned with going home or? Um, you're seeing people getting stabbed, you're seeing violence, or are you just concerned with, you know, just, just surviving? Uh, at, at, at Salinas Valley is where I got my reality check because I had participated in riots, you know what I'm saying? Um, I had participated in a whole lot of squabbling, you know what I'm saying? Some other little shit, you know what I mean? Um, but <clears throat> Salinas Valley is also where I kind of, I ain't going to say use the lack of a better term, but I changed my program, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? Because <clears throat> it was a situation where it was a dude who was from my area. He wasn't from my city. He was from Wasco, but he ran with us. And this dude had the sack. You know what I'm saying? He, he, he had it. You know what I'm saying? But and he was doing his thing, and he ended up selling, doing transactions with the white, and he sold them some bullshit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and in that and in, in in that situation, the white boys came to the Crips and kind of asked him, and they sent him to me. You know what I'm saying? By that time, I wasn't that dude or nothing like that, but. I had a cool enough reputation as where dudes respected me to say, hey, man, take care of y'all business. You know what I'm saying? Handle your homie. I kind of listened to the white boy, you know what I mean? And he kind of told me what happened. I went to him. Like, hey, bro, like, this is what he's saying. Oh, man, fuck that. He's a dope fan. He's just trying to, you know what I mean? He trying to get over, bro. Don't even listen to nothing he's talking about. So I kind of went to the white boy like, I mean, you know what I mean? So, yeah. but he chose to do business with him again. And um, 
uh, he came over to my cell and brought it this time. He came and brought me the shit. I took it. I went and gave it to a, a southerner that I was cool with. Man, try this out. Tell me what it was. You know what I mean? And he came back and was like, bro, that's some bullshit. So I tried to reach out to the dude. We, mind you, we on lockdown. So they got all the crips on lockdown. Everybody else is out. But some had in sued, but they got all the crips on lockdown. And um, I kind of was like, hey, bro, kind of, he was a mac rep. So he was a dude that was allowed to come out and, and mingle, try to defuse any type of situation. That's what mac reps were, people don't know. Mm -hmm. He would kind of go to the program office, kind of, you know, be the mediator between whatever's going on in the yard and the staff. You know what I'm saying? Right. So he would, he came in the building. I'm trying to flag him down. He was avoiding me, avoiding me. And then I just told my cell, he on this nigga ass the first chance we get. So uh, he came out, he came in through the building and it was around the time for us to come out for showers. And, uh, and there was a way to pick the lock from the shower. You know what I'm saying? Take a little toothbrush, you just pop it and the, the shower would come open. And uh, we came out for our shower and he and he whipped out. He had his little folder, a little nice little cool one. And he was like, man, don't do it, homie. He just kept telling, like, don't do it, homie. Don't do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't do it. Me, I'm, I don't know, 19, 20, 20 at the time. Whop! I hit the nigga so hard up against the door, he dropped the knife. I don't, I just kicked the knife. He tried to sprint down the tier, and my 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 bunkie tripped him, and we only whop, whop, whop. We whopping this nigga on the ground, and I'm kicking him. They get down, get down. Boom, they shoot the block. Get down, boom, they shoot. I'm, I'm watching the whole incident, you know what I'm saying, while I'm participating in it. My nigga get hit in the back with the little fucking hockey puck. I seen this shit come off his tape skin from his back. And this nigga's trying to crawl for, he's trying to crawl for uh, safety. So when he try to crawl up under the, the bench, you know, the bench stool has got four seats in the day room, but it's also got screws that's coming up out the ground like this. Right. I'm kicking this thing and I'm just kicking him. I'm stomping him until I see blood. You know what I'm saying? I just see blood splattering everywhere. And I'm kicking this nigga on the ground. And I'll never forget this fucking lieutenant. He hated blacks. He was a black lieutenant named Hope. And that motherfucker come running in that motherfucker and he, Hit me with that baton so motherfucking hard. Damn near knocked me out. I hit the ground. I'm on the ground. They shaking me up. They, you know what I'm saying? They put me in cuffs and all the shit. And he yelling for MTA, MTA. You know what I'm saying? Get the gurney, get the gurney. And uh, they wheel him out. You know what I'm saying? And they take me to the motherfucking, sit me in the cage in front of the program office. And he just telling me like, man, you, you might have killed this dude. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he's bleeding so bad. You might have killed this dude. And uh, they take me to Ad Seg, you know what I'm saying, which is in Building 5. It was like a pre-hole. So they had two different holes in Salinas Valley. Uh -huh. uh, so they took me to the pre-hole. pre, -ha pre, -pre -hole, And uh, the weirdest shit happened. So, uh, and I still thank this dude to my to this day, man. You know what I mean? Because I had a 33-year sentence, but I didn't have life in prison. Right. You know what I mean? And um, this dude, so I go to court, you know what I'm saying, off the, off the dribble, facing life in prison. Like, they filed charges, all the shit. You know what I mean? So they appoint me an attorney, all this stuff. And the attorney's like, man, take this and take that. And I'm like, I ain't taking shit. And uh, the same police who had allowed me to get out of the cell when he, because he kind of told us, like, man, y'all man, kick back on my watch. Don't get in nothing. He was working in the hole back then. He's like, man, I got a kite for you. And I'm like, what's that? He's like, I got something for you. So when this when they escorted me to uh, to yard and going back type shit. And uh, he gave me a kite, bro. And the kite was a letter from the victim. Telling me, man, I'm gonna stand up for you. Don't tell him this. Don't tell him that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm gonna tell him that just stick with the story that you know what I'm saying that I assaulted you first. You know what I'm saying? That type of shit. And um, I didn't even have to get that far, bro. You know what I mean? When I went to court, this, you know what I'm saying? They had appointed him a lawyer to be pretty much, uh, you know what I'm saying, to testify against me and told told the courts that that, that he assaulted me first with a weapon. Mm -hmm. So uh, they end up uh, dropping the charges for that county. And just giving me a shoe turn for the institution. You know what I mean, and uh, that shit changed my life, bro. They got these tables that's bolted to the ground, and they got these screws that stick, these metal screws, they stick out about an inch. And so, unbeknownst to you, you said while you was kicking him, some type of way his eye had got up against that screw or whatever. And so, when yeah. he kicked him, it knocked his eye out. Knocked his eye. He lost his eye in, in the transaction. Right. He, and he, he was just pretty much trying to duck from, 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 my, from my blows. And, and kind of proned out on top of the screw, or trying to get up under the bench. You right. know what I mean? Trying to avoid me from swinging on him because I wasn't stabbing him. You know what I mean? So he, he was trying to avoid the, the the brutality or whatever was going on. And when I began to kick him because I really couldn't swing, I didn't want to get down and just swing. I started kicking him, not really kicking him, but kind of stomping down. And that's when I kind of started to notice the blood just kind of splattering everywhere. 
not knowing, you know what I'm saying? When he was telling me like he might die, uh, in my mind, get the fuck out of here. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't that serious. I saw that he was on the journey. But right. his face was so bloody, I didn't know he had lost an eye. You know right. What I'm I didn't know it was an eye that he had lost in the in, in the whole little scheme of it. And at some point, what California institutions had started doing when people were assaulted, stabbed in these prisons, as I had mentioned before, they started filing charges for these assaults as if the person who was charged with the assault was on the street. So whatever particular right. county that prison was located in, they would file charges and you would be going back and forth to court as if right. you were on the street. Uh, uh, fighting another charge and, and looking at more time. And so you said they was attempting to give you a, a life sentence. Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that, that, that went on for about, um, I believe about six months going back and forth. You know what I mean? Cause they do pretty much the same shit going to all these prelims and all of that stuff, taking me back and forth to court. You know what I mean? But once I had gotten that kite, I had already pretty much known that it was going to be a cool situation. So I had to sit back there for like another maybe 60 days, maybe 90 days before they actually dropped the charges. You know what I'm saying? And um, uh, 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 pretty much let the institution just deal with me from that point on. And and so as as, as um, because the charge was great bodily injury. Uh, it was some weird shit. You know what I mean? Like all kind of it was some weird shit. You know what I mean? And as far great. as you know, whatever yeah. happened with, with the with the individual who lost his eye? Man, uh, going back to being humble, bro, that situation in my life, uh, I think I had maybe a total of maybe three fights from that point. So that happened in 2009. But I'm sorry, that happened in 2004. I got out in 2012, so that's a matter of eight years. So I went from selly fights, squabbing, uh, riots, and all of that shit. I, bro, I, you know what I'm saying? Because I had 33 years in state prison. I didn't have life, you know what I'm saying? That time right there was like, that was my reality check, like, man, you really ain't trying to do life. And I was like, nigga, I'm not trying to do life. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it it changed my whole program up from that point on. And um, uh, I ended up running into this dude, weird shit, bro. So I get out in 2012. Uh, 2013, I finally get a job, and I'm filing taxes for the first time in my life, bro. And I'm at Liberty Tax. And um, I see a dude come in that motherfucker. He got the little patch on. But he, because he had, but what he got gained some weight. I had gained some weight also, also, but he had gained some weight, so I didn't really notice him. And he looked up and he like, bro, don't you, don't I know you? You know what I'm saying? Because people know me from having long hair. I was a little bit thinner. You know what I'm saying? And um, and I'm like looking at this dude like, no, nah, I don't. Like I don't know you. You know what I'm saying? I didn't at the time. So he was like, man, I know you from somewhere. And I looked. I just noticed that fucking chrome, like the teeth. Like he just had all silver teeth in the front. And I'm like, Bartlett. This dude had 25 to life, bro, I believe, for some weed, like four dime bags of weed. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. He fell into that three-strike, 94-95 situation as well. So he had caught three strikes for some, for some bullshit-ass weed. And uh, they had let him out on, on appeal. So that's how I ended up seeing him. Mm. So I, you know what I mean? And I'll be honest with you. You know what I mean? I'm on some gangster shit. I wasn't on no gangster shit at the time. I looked at this dude. This dude, man, small as fuck. You know what I mean? But he had gained some weight. And I was like, this nigga was trying to do something to me. So I told my wife at the time, which I was married, let's get the fuck up out of here. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I smash off. You know what I mean? I leave. So uh, I believe in 2015, I'm riding dirt bikes. You know what I'm saying? We ride, me and my crew, we riding dirt bikes, banshees and shit. And we uh, we doing tricks and shit like that. And I take the police on a high-speed chase. So when I take them on a high-speed chase, they arrest me. They catch me, arrest me, throw me back in jail. You know what I mean? I bail out. And when I was threatened to go back to prison, they tried to give me like four years with 80%, some type of shit. And I ended up taking a plea bargain for a year suspended with, um, I had to go work in like the welfare office. And when you're in the welfare office, you see all these homeless people, you know what I'm saying? And um, I end up, one day I'm sweeping and I'm just sweeping the building and I see this dude come up and it's this dude, bro, that I just, that, that, that got me out of a life, life, life sentence in prison. And I kind of ran up to him and he's scared. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm trying to get a nigga everything I got in my pocket. Like, man, like, hey, bro, let me take you out to eat, man. But he afraid. You know what I'm saying? He don't know what I'm on. You know what I mean? But me in my life, I'm like, bro, like, this dude saved me, bro. You know what I'm saying? If the nigga out there right now, I'll still take you out to eat, man. Let me say a few things real quick. So um, due to the fact that you got charged with an assault on him and you was potentially looking at 
getting a life sentence while you're in prison with the opportunity to go home, it kind of humbled you and it made you, it made you view, um, I guess it, it made you carry yourself different. It made you yeah. kind of realize your situation. And then also when he, you approached him the first time and, and he recognized you and said, Hey, don't I know you? What was his vibe? Like, did you feel he was on some gangster stuff Did you feel he wanted some? No, back or? no, no, but I don't know if a lot of dudes experience it when you get out, man. Like when I first got out, bro, I, I was, I was afraid to be around anybody. You know what I'm saying? I was just 18 years of my life. I know you did 20 plus, but you know what I mean? The, the, the sight of anybody just walking up to you, you know what I'm saying? It was a little bit frightening. You know what I'm saying? It was a little bit different to me because I didn't recognize this dude. You know, this gang, like I said, Bakersfield, you know, at this time was at an all-time high, like way worse than it was when I was back there gang banging. You know what I'm saying? It was murders and all the fuckeries going on. So when a dude walk up to me, I'm not in my jurisdiction, meaning I'm not in my area. I'm not in my neighborhood. I'm way out where I don't even supposed to be at the beginning. With I don't have no weapon, no nothing. Telling me like, nigga, you don't remember me? That shit kind of shook me, you know what I'm saying? I mean, though he's smarter than me, but what this nigga got, you know what I'm saying? So I got the hell up out of there, you feel me? I, you know, I ain't gonna lie to you. So now it, it did. Now that I look back, even back then after that, I didn't, I didn't see it as being threatening. I just seen it as, you know, what I mean, I, I was trying to protect myself more so. You know what I'm saying? Because he obviously a attempted to. He didn't come swinging, you know what I'm saying? He attempted to try to come greet me in some sort of fashion. Right. Yep. You know, I definitely I definitely understand. And what you explained was just you was on a sense of hyper. You you know, you was hyper alert. And, and like you said, man, before, you know, you and I before we went to jail, you know, we carried guns on a regular. We was involved in violence. So once you get out and you don't have a gun, either you you're not trying to carry a gun, maybe because you're mature, you're not trying to go to prison, whatever reason. But you're still in areas that contain violence. You feel naked. You feel vulnerable. And, you know, you have to realize that, hey, man, just because I changed my life, I changed my thinking. Everybody else is not thinking like that. Right. Real shit. Without having the means. You know what I mean? To be honest, homie, I think we and, and to, a, to a certain point, we become scared when we see other individuals who was like us back in the, right. those days. Because right, you right. Knew that back when we was immature, we was liable to do anything. And we know you still have those dudes running around to this day. Right, right, real shit. And it's a little bit different, dude, because everybody, you know, not even say everybody, but the drugs is prominent out here, you know what I'm saying? Like, when I was younger, you know what I mean, the, the strongest drug, that, I mean, you had dudes that were smoking KJ, very few dudes that were smoking PCP, but we, everybody was smoking weed. Nowadays, niggas popping pills, and you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of dudes is on different drugs. They just, you ain't snort coke, you ain't the homie, you feel me? Like, you know, it's very few dudes that I ain't gonna say everybody. But that's the sentiment out here. So, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, these dudes don't really think to be like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know this dude or, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know who. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what is what. You know what I'm saying? Right. At this time, I, I got out in March, uh, May of 90, uh, 2012. This happened around, like, April of 2013. So, I'm freshly out. I don't, you know what I mean? Even all out of year. And I remind you, when I first paroled, I didn't parole to my city. I had to, Kern County didn't want me no more. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, they told me. Nah, bro, you you can't be here. You know what I'm saying? You a gang member, shot caller, and all that type of shit that they try to throw on you. You know what I mean? Just because they don't want you here, they don't want that type of shit in their county. They made me move to a whole nother city. So about time when I came back in 2013, you know what I mean? That was kind of my introduction to never leaving because I had, you know, unfortunately I had left my wife. You know what I'm saying? I moved back to Bakersfield full time because I had no other choice, even though they threatened me all the time of going to jail. Right now, in the in the course of telling that story too. Um, you mentioned where the second time the guy had sold the white dude some 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 bad drugs, you end up getting getting in possession of the drugs and you took the drugs to a South Sider that you was cool with, you know. Yeah. And I get that because there's sometimes, you know, there's rumors that um, especially back back in those days, South Siders didn't do any business with blacks. Well, you know, they weren't supposed to, but of course, if if everybody done the things that they were supposed to, nobody would be in prison. So right. I, I point that out to say that, you know, just because there's rules, whether they relate to blacks, Southerners, Hispanics, whoever, everybody doesn't always follow the rules. Yeah. And most, most, most riots, bullshit that's, that's racially involved is, is I, I, I'll say 70% of it is involving money. You know what I'm saying? Why well, we ain't just having no riot with another race because they're another race. Some sort of money's involved, the debt, you know what I'm saying? The other 30% might be disrespect, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
whether you went and done something, violated, you know, went on somebody's side of the day room or, uh, you know, to be honest with you, you know, you, you know how blacks are in prison. Let's keep it all the way 100. We, we kind of run how we run. You know what I'm saying? Like there is no major structure that structures all of us. So right. you'll have a lot of dudes, like speaking of the Rico situation, you'll have dudes that's disrespectful. You know what I'm saying? At certain institutions, some dudes might turn the blind eye to be like, man, you know, that dude's a weirdo. You know what I'm saying? But some, uh, most you know, Hispanics, they very, very militant, very, very territorial. You know what I'm saying? They very, very respectful. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it, it, it's it's either or. So I'll, I'll say 70% of most of the riots that happen in California state institutions is over a drug debt or some money that's old. You know what I mean? And, right. and speaking or, of or the Hispanics, of right, right, or, or it's, it's, it's either one of the two. It's not like, you know what, I feel like just going to take off on the Mexicans. That, that ain't the type of situation that happens. Nine times out of ten is such and such, old such and such with some shit, you know what I'm saying? Again, they don't want to pay or they can't pay, and, and it just other things ensue, you know what I'm saying? So going back to the, 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 the story with me giving it to a Hispanic, of course they did it, bro. Oh, yeah, even, and they would use the white boys because the white boys had the same similar politics, but they were very, very more more loose with it on certain institutions. Because I've been in, I've been on yards where the white boys was like, you know what I'm saying? They'll rather deal with somebody else. They'll deal with the others through the blacks. They're the middlemen. So right. a lot of the times, the white boys would be the middlemen to the southerners getting drugs. So they would use the white boys to get drugs from us. You know what I'm saying? That type of situation. And that's the type of situation it was. The Southerner dude, I just so happened to work with him well, behind closed doors. You know, when you're in like those uh, vocational trades behind the walls, you know, on the other side of the wall, they, 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 hey man, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like it's a little bit less seen, you know what I'm saying? You can, right. you can do a little bit more that ain't seen on the yard, you know what I'm saying? Because you have, might have to sit next to a dude, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to in a chow hall, you know, some institutions, you can pick where you, where you sit at, you know what right. I'm saying? Right. That type of situation. And so, um, what was it like for you by you by by you not being a lifer, knowing that you know outside of catching another case or something, you are definitely going home. What was it like during the time it started winding down? Now you're getting into these last you know month or two for you to go home. Uh, it was different, you know. what I'm saying I, I had never really been in that situation, and I'll be honest with you, I you, people use that term institutionalized. You know what I'm saying, and I believe. 100 percent that i was probably institutionalized because there was a great even like me without me having a life and life term sentence there was a lot of times where i didn't really care to go home you know what i'm saying like uh whether i was having too much fun i didn't really look at my out date or i, I looked at the support you know what i'm saying I, that was one thing that i kind of hated throughout my whole term is that you know what I mean? That I didn't have the support that I thought I was going to get, whether it be my family or my homeboys. You know what I'm saying? Because I was one of them dudes. You know what I'm saying? And and none of my homies did shit for me while I was in jail. You feel me? So so let me ask you this. Was the was the idea of paroling, not necessarily knowing what your financial situation was going to be, how you was going to, you know, uh, take care of yourself. Was that a little bit, was that a little bit like nerve wracking? Because I remember telling a story about, um, my friend got into a fight with a dude who had done about 13, 14 years, and he said he didn't want to go home. And at that time, I couldn't understand, you know, I couldn't understand uh, why a person wouldn't want to go home, especially by me being a lifer. But um, I believe that's exactly what he was dealing with, not knowing what his freedom was going to look like. So how was that? How was that like, you know, coming from a person like you that's saying that you didn't always have the best and greatest support, you know? Um, later on, I, I, I had met my wife in prison. You know what I'm saying? So um i did have a little bit more back back backbone support you know what i'm saying so i kind of knew i got married four years before i got uh paroled so i i kind of knew what my situation was going to look like you know what i mean uh i had accumulated a lot of money while i was there my last probably six or seven years so my situation probably a little bit different than most because i i knew whether i was married or not i was coming home straight you know what i mean i think just the unknown most times people and I just being honest, you know what I mean? We on we on we on the podcast, we on the doing this, but my fear was coming out, getting involved in some shit to come back. That was my greatest fear. Right. You know what I mean, I, I I you know, it's to start over. Like I don't want to come out because I heard her so many stories with my nigga S from uh Linwood, the little nigga rider with all the shits in Salinas Valley. Nigga get out and get killed by his own homies. You know what I'm saying? I had situations where my little homies that I was incarcerated with got out and got killed. 
So all of the unknowns like that made a motherfucker like, damn, I guess it, it ain't that bad in here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm kind of supporting myself. I'm doing my thing. I do miss my family. I do miss my friends. You know what I'm saying? But it was just the kind. It was, bro. It's 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 crazy how mentally you all over the place. You don't know what's what. You know what I'm saying? You don't know how to feel. So far as like the financial security, I I, I didn't feel that way because my later six years left of my prison term, I was I was straight. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna lie to you. I I I, I parole with like a hundred thousand, mm-hmm. keeping one hundred. And. That's what that's something that I was gonna I was gonna um talk a little bit about the hustling in prison. It, it's extremely it's extremely lucrative to to hustle in prison and stuff. And um is is, is that something that while you're hustling in prison, you're you know um worried about getting another charge? Because I've seen people get caught with just, just weed when, you know, weed and get three strikes and stuff like that. And to be honest, myself, I was a little apprehensive about messing with the uh, the big drugs, the heroin, the weed. I would do it from time to time if there was no cigarettes available. But my thing, I was a cigarette man. And so what was But you definitely can make more money with the with the, uh, you know, with the harder drugs. I, I, I can say this because I'm not going criminal. I'm not incriminating myself by admitting it because it was. I had messed with me. I fought with the tobacco. You know what I'm right. saying? So they can't come and file nothing on me. I, I was a tobacco man. I, I was bringing four, five cans of bugler every weekend for five years straight. Right. And selling the motherfuckers for thousand dollars and seven hundred dollars. You saw I made at the very minimum of you know what I'm saying five to ten thousand dollars a week uh for like a greater part of my years. Now granted, you know what I mean? I did take care of a lot of my homeboys. I was fucking money off buying cars and all kind of shit. My wife lived great while I was in prison. Um, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, um, I didn't, I, I didn't worry about another charges cause I didn't, I didn't do with the legal drugs. I didn't fuck with heroin. We, I mean, uh, weed and I didn't, I didn't deal with none of that. It was straight tobacco. Fuck with them duckets. You know what I mean? About them duckets. Boy. Right, right. Yeah. Hey man, hey, them duckets, them duckets was lovely. And hey, there's something else, something else that you mentioned, um, you was apprehensive about, coming out and being harmed, getting into a situation and, and possibly losing your life. And I can honestly say, man, I have heard of a lot of people from Bakersfield coming home, getting shot, getting killed. You know, it's it's extremely dangerous. You know, Baker, Bakersfield is, you know, especially a few years ago, was extremely wild. And, and so what is that like, man? You know, doing time, walking on the yard sometimes with some of your homies three, four years, and then they get out and you hear two months later, this dude didn't got killed. Well, uh, the, the demographics of Bakersfield, man, going, uh, speaking on just a, a piece portion of what you said, man, there's a lot of dudes come here. Like, I, I've, I got my boy, man, I ain't gonna really say his name, but he's from Los Angeles. I was institu- I was, I was, I was incarcerated with him when he, he had life in prison. He did about 30, maybe 29, paroled and paroled to Bakersfield. That was where his parole, that's where, because they didn't want him to go back to LA County, so they made him go to Kern County, and he's out here still to this day. And he said at night, God damn, y'all. He didn't met four or five dudes till this day. Like, like, I just met this nigga and he gets smacked. Like, a lot of dudes underestimate our town when it comes to this violent shit. And I ain't, you know, sit up here, you know what I mean? Be like, but yeah, Bakersfield been underrated for a long time, bro. Like, it's a lot of shit that's been going on. A lot of gang wars. That most of our gang wars is over 20, 30 years. You know what I'm saying? And I, it, it, it's wild out here, man. It's, it's, it's a smaller city. You know, we don't have the big downtowns like L.A. or San Diego, but it's it's a it's a, a, a area wise. It's a it's a nice size city. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, man. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. Right. And and so what was it finally like for you to to be able to parole after doing all that time? Uh, it, man, it was hell, bro. Keep 100, man. So uh, it seemed like they were trying to push my that's why made me believe like I wasn't I think say I wasn't going home. But uh. I got 30 days. They made it into 45. Oh, you got 15. They, like, they they kept changing my date back. So it was like, oh, you 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 had a 115 that was found and blah, blah, blah. They pushed my shit back 30 days. Oh, there was whoop whoop We miscalculated your time. They pushed it back 12 more days. So all the way up until the time I even went when I paroled and went to R&R, bro, I see most dudes get out of R&R by 9 in the morning. I didn't get out that motherfucker till 1. I'm in R&R. They still like. We ain't got your paperwork, so I'm over there. I'm, you know, what I mean, I'm stressed the fuck out. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so yeah, all up until the time I got parole, man, it, it, it was it was a disbelief. Yeah, you know I mean, and I never forget it. Uh, the day I got out, we went to the beach. You know what I'm saying? Um, went to the DMV all in the same day. 
trying to get my license and trying to get my life in order. Yeah, all I've been to the all I've been to the day I had parole. All I've been to the day I had parole, man. Um, it was just weird, bro. You know what I'm saying? I had seen so many of my young homies, man, get out and get killed, and you know what I mean. It, it, it was the fear of the unknown. I ain't gonna lie to you. When I got out, I had some close situations myself. Well, it's definitely it's definitely good, man, to talk to you on this side of the wall. Like I say, I believe we um. We done. I don't know how many years, maybe four or five years, because all the, you know a lot of that time goes by real fast, and you forget. But you know, of course, you know we used to kick it a little bit, um, mess with a whole lot of the same people. You know, Nemo, Blue, uh, uh, Lefty. You know, you was out there playing. You know, you was you was the quarterback. You know, you had yeah, a little, the animals, my boy, the animals. Yeah, my you boy, had a little, shout out to my boys, man. Little, and, little football team and shit, and uh, you know, you had a bunch of little fast young dudes out there, and yeah, we we were just chilling, man. But um. Uh, it's always good, you know, to see people on this side of the wall, man, and uh, see them out, you know, having having fun with their family and just being, you know, being successful. Yeah, and it's a, once once again, man, it's a shout out to man. Like a lot of YouTubers don't know, man, Chill was the hardest dude on the yard for years rapping. You know what I'm saying? And I remember my boy KG. Shout out to my boy KD from Dodge City, man. Uh, nigga with the with the tennis, we used to sit there and watch the nigga Chill come out with tennis bag. I used to call you Chill Agassi. <laughs> <laughs> And I keep telling him KG was the one that started calling me Arthur Trash, man. Arthur I'm gonna definitely, Trash, try, man. definitely try to hurry up and get him on here soon. And you know, Barry, hey, I was nice on that tennis court, and I liked it because the tennis court it was a fun game, man, and it was less argumentative. You know, like you say, we got to keep it real sometimes, man. Yeah, that man. Basketball court, man, can get wicked out there sometimes. Yes, you know? indeed, man. You, you know, you see a lot of shit, man. What my during my whole term, bro? Like I said, it was a journey for me because when I first got to prison. It was more so about not being a punk, not, you know what I'm saying, never being marked out, never being, you know what I'm saying, like, never, I, I never wanted to be a victim, you know what I'm saying, that was my whole thing, like, nigga ain't gonna victimize me, nigga, and I'm All gonna right. put on for my city, because we beggars for an 11 four institution, we always was short, you know what I'm saying, it didn't come until later on where Bakersfield was like, uh, you know, you would find five, six, seven dudes on a level four institution. We was deep on level three, level twos, but on a level four institution, you know what I'm saying? I had to fight. I had to get mine in, you know what I mean? So uh, uh, going to that level level three was was a, was a chance for me to kind of be who I wanted to be. You know what I'm saying? I was out there. You see the different side of me playing softball, like you said, being with my boy Nemo, little blue, le a lefty and all these dudes playing football with these little young dudes. You know what I'm saying? That shit was fun, man. You know what I'm saying? And it kind of uh, you know, everything we go through in life, bro, is 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 is, is a trial and a tribulation, man. And it showed me, yeah, you know, I can be myself. You know what I'm saying? I ain't I ain't gotta be this hardcore ass nigga. You know what I'm saying? I done done yeah. there, been there. You know what I'm saying? I ain't got nothing else to prove. And and last question, let me ask you, how do you how you feel about like you said when we first came to prison as opposed to 15, 20 years later down the line, how things change. To me, some in cer certain situations, it seemed like there was less respect among the, you know, the brothers. It seemed like some of the young dudes would come in there, man, and they was they was game goofy, for lack of a better word. They didn't have the, the street schooling, it seemed like a lot of us had at a younger age, you know, and that's why, you know, I would stay away from the basketball court. People would come in there and say stuff that you wouldn't hear said 15, 20 years ago, and so to avoid a problem, you know, I switched over to tennis. But how did you did you recognize that, or how, how do you yeah. feel about that? Yeah, it, it was it was hard to it was a hard to be a part of it. It was hard to be to monitor. You know what I'm saying? Keeping the one hundred. You know what I mean? A lot of my little homies, they know me. You know, it was me and my bunky. We we ran a cold program for us to keep us in line. You know what I mean? We wasn't gonna let that old school tradition fall on the backside. You know what I'm saying? I didn't got down with my own homies over it. You know what I'm saying you gonna respect something. I don't give a fuck what you got going on in the streets. When you come up in this motherfucker, it's different, bro. You know what I'm saying? You're going to fall in line. But I would see, like, other dudes from other cities, nigga, come and just just be – just it was it was different, bro. Like, when I first got – like I said, going through the level four system, you know what I'm saying, uh, you didn't see the jackalism. You didn't see all this shit. The, you know, calling another man a bitch back then, bro, was like, nigga, you either going to squabble up, nigga, or leave the yard. So you didn't, you didn't see that type of behavior. Right. You didn't see, you know what I'm saying, no disrespect, but – you know, I, I come from when you didn't see Hispanics using the nigga word. I, I grew up with them. They right. did it but in prison. Bro, it fucked me up the first time I seen the South Side. be like, my nigga. I was like, what the fuck? Like, yo, that shit fucked me up. Like, right. on the yard? Like, you know what I'm saying? But he didn't mean no disrespect. That was just how they spoke. You know what I'm saying? That's right. that's the turn of the, you know what I'm saying, the popularity and hip hop or make, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
a lot of shit that happened. You know what I mean? And then it's the drugs once again, bro. It's, right. You know right. what I'm saying? The drugs is so prominent that a lot of dudes feel like it's okay to be, you know what I'm saying, a, 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 a cokehead or whatever it may be. Right. Like you see a lot of bit more horse playing, a lot of more like just the disrespect. Like niggas call each other's bitches like it's regular nowadays. I, I just don't get it, bro. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah, that, that was that was one of the ones that I started to notice that I still ain't partaking in. You know what I mean? But yeah, that was it. It was hard to watch. It right. was hard to watch because you would have to make sure, at least for me, to make sure my homies didn't get a part of it with nobody else. That right. jackal shit. You feel me? Right. So that, that was hard. Yeah, it, it was like you say, it was definitely it was definitely um difficult to watch. And and you know, when you come into prison one way and then you slowly see it change and it just, you know, it's just it definitely was hard because it wasn't it wasn't what we were used to, you know. And I guess it made me realize that, you know, um started to get a little up there or whatever, you know. Yeah, and you know, I mean everything, everything in society changes, man. There's always an evolution, man. But God leave, bro, like some of the shit is just weird as fuck. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Like I can name the tapping niggas on their ass and shit like, it, bro, that shit was weird as fuck to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just couldn't imagine a nigga slapping me on my ass in 95. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, I just couldn't imagine, you know what I'm saying? The niggas do it with a smile. Like, that shit yeah. fucks me up, bro. You feel me? Like, yeah. just weird shit. You know what I mean? So, but I, I, I respect it, though. You know what I'm saying? In the sense where that's what the, so, today's society has become. Now, I'm, I'm out the way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I'm doing my own thing. Right. Most definitely, man. And then once again, Barry, thank you, man, for, you know, um, sharing your experience with me, coming on here, being candid, um, letting me know how, you know, your experience was. I appreciate it. And I believe you are the first guest that I've had from Bakersfield, man. So thank you for representing for the 805. It's for everybody 805. That's well, always you, asking for bring me somebody on, you know, uh, from Bakersfield. We got Bear, you know. Uh, and thank you. I appreciate it, man. For sure. Chill, man. Keep doing your thing, man. I'm going to stay watching you, brother, man. You got one of the dopest channels out, bro. I appreciate you having me on here. Man, shout out to some of the guests that I know, especially my boy G Slim. Man, he was the truth, man. I ain't going to sit there and lie to you. Everything he said, man, G Slim was with the shiznits, man. That dude was something else. But, uh, 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 yeah, man, I'm going to keep watching you, man. Keep watching. Keep bringing that heat, bro. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it, man. Enjoy your, uh, the rest of your day. Happy belated birthday, and uh, you know, take care of yourself, and definitely, definitely stay safe out there, man. Yes, indeed, man. Yes, indeed, man. I wish I could give you a tour of my spot, man. I'm living so different, man. You feel me? Like it, like you know what I mean? Like I came out here, man. I got me a job, you know what I mean? And you know what I mean? I'm living the life that I should have been living, bro. So you know what I mean? I work hard, staying out the way, Brody. All right, that's what's up, man. Yes, indeed, man. Take care, bro, bro. Much All love right. to you always, man. All right, much love to you too, fam. So beware, fuck what you saying, cause these cowards ain't playing fair They shoot at you, you shoot at them, they snitch, and they don't care Fuck gang banging, I'd rather be a square These niggas ain't who they say they is, so beware Fuck what you saying, cause these cowards ain't playing fair They shoot at you, you shoot at them, they snitch, and they don't care Fuck gang banging, I'd rather be a square Yeah, I swear to God the game is cold, homie why? I popped on a pussy ass nigga, had to restore on me. What happened next? That nigga came to court and told on me. Put that on some. That's on my soul, homie. Called the highway patrol on me. Plus the sheriff and cops. He told him my name was Eric and I carried the block. Soon as you start blowing shots, the niggas going to tail. They'll have a meeting with the cops and then you going to jail. They'll tell him about the shoot and take him, show him his well. DA trying to seal your casket, they gon' throw him the nails. They wanna put me back in the cell when heavy with an L again. Same strip surface and go. Read my mail again, had me far away in the bay. I'm talking Pelican, eating cold ass soy burgers and warm gelatin. I'm far too intelligent to fall for that twice. Niggas yelling gang gang and ain't about that life. And they'll turn rat right in front of your face. Get your found guilty plus a hundred years on the case. Your mama sitting in the courtroom with tears on her face. Her baby shack on feet, hands, and waist. God damn, these niggas ain't who they say they is. So beware. Fuck what you saying, cause these cowards ain't playing fair They shoot at you, you shoot at them, they snitch And they don't care, fuck 
gang bang and I'd rather be a square These niggas ain't who they say they is, so beware Fuck what you saying, cause these cowards ain't playing fair They shoot at you, you shoot at them, they snitch, and they don't care Fuck gang bang and I'd rather be a square Yeah